and welcome to Code Slicing. In this episode of this exciting series on processing state, we're going to be picking up where we left off in part one, taking the debounce state we created and using it to create a reusable property wrapper, thereby increasing convenience as well as code clarity. If you haven't seen the first episode, now would be a great time to do it since I'd hate for you to feel at all lost. In addition to that, after my repeated insistence in the last episode, I'm hoping that by now you've seen my series on property wrappers since I'm going to be assuming at least a pretty good understanding of them in this episode. As always, if you have any questions about what we do in this tutorial, let me know in the comments and I'll do my very best to help you. So let's start by building our property wrapper. First, we need to label it with at property wrapper and we'll make it private, debounce state, and we'll leave it there for now. Now we need to rename our original debound state because obviously we're using it here. We're going to rename it to backing state. And while I wouldn't normally give something such a generic name, I'm happy to this time since I'm going to move it inside our property wrapper. Now we're going to move this state object into our property wrapper as well. And there are a couple of things we need to do here. We need to rename it to backing state because that's what it is. And we need to change the type from debound state to our new backing state type. We're not going to initialize it here. We're going to take care of that when initializing our debounce state property wrapper. But we do have to give it a type here because as you can see, backing state expects a generic parameter. So we're going to make our property wrapper generic over value as well. And we can then set this to the same thing. Now that our state object is set up, another thing we need to account for is the fact that state object is a dynamic property. Therefore, if our property wrapper also conforms to that protocol, our property wrapper will be able to participate in informing a view when things change and therefore trigger updates. Next, we're going to add a couple of initializers. The first one is going to take an argument named wrapped value, which is required if we want to be able to assign values to a property the way we can with the normal state property wrapper. We're also going to add a parameter for the delay, but we'll put in the default here and remove it from the backing state initializer. Rather than assign our backing state here, I'm going to add another initializer with an argument named initial value, which I like to do to allow the explicit creation of a property wrapper without the need to use the wrapped value argument, which is essentially an implementation detail of property wrappers. They do the same thing in the state property wrapper, and I think it is good policy since initial value is more descriptive than wrapped value, in my opinion. And now we can call this initializer from the first one and set the backing state object here. So remember, we've got to use the underscore here to access the property wrapper itself. So underscore backing state is a new state object. We're setting the wrapped value to a new backing state object with an initial value of initial value and a delay of delay. Now every property wrapper needs a wrapped value, which determines the behavior of the overall property wrapper. And that's how we're going to tie in the debouncing functionality. So wrapped value with a getter and a non-mutating setter. The getter is going to return the debounced value of our state and the setter is going to set the current value of our state. The result is that we can set the value as often as we like, but the value returned by get is going to be the debounced version. We're almost there, but we've still got a very important part to take care of. You see, this property wrapper is designed to be used as a replacement for the normal state property wrapper when we want our inputs to be debounced. Usually, however, including our example case, state is used with a text field or text editor, so we need to be able to pass a binding to the state to those views. Just like in the case of the state property wrapper, we're going to do that via the projected value. So we say projected value, which returns a binding, and we're going to create our own binding explicitly in order to have control over the getters and setters. So we know the setter is going to set the current value, but we've got a decision to make about the behavior of the getter, because if the control we're passing our binding to relies on this to perform its internal UI updates, then it won't update in real time as the user types if we use the debounced value for the getter. In the case of the text editor view, it appears they do not make copies of the initial value. So we do have to, in fact, pass back the current value. In fact, what I'll do is I'll set it to debounced value and you can see the effect that has when we've got it up and running. And then we can come back to it and put it back to the current value. And with that, our property wrapper is done. So let's try it out. 
All we need to do is go down to our view and add some filter text, which we'll label as a debounce state, private var, filter text, and we'll initialize it to an empty string. Then we don't need to be referring explicitly to the current value or the debounced value down here. So I'm going to remove those. Let's run it and see what happens. And as I'm randomly typing into this, it's only updating both boxes when the delay between key presses is long enough for the debounce operator to let a value through. So you can see that I wasn't lying when I said that in the case of the text editor view, we need to be returning the current value on the getter as well as the setter in our custom binding. In fact, I think this is probably the safest way to go in all cases if you want a really flexible property wrapper. And now if we run it again, it should be working just the way we expect. Absolutely fantastic. And can you believe it? We've got debounce state in a reusable property wrapper that is used just like the normal state property wrapper. But what if they wanted to change the delay? Then you would use it like this, passing in the delay argument here. And excuse the fact that colored highlighting doesn't really work when you're using an initializer in a property wrapper in this way, maybe in Xcode 14, they'll sort that out. When used in this way, the framework is actually calling this initializer, passing in the empty string as the wrapped value. I go through all that in much more detail in that series of property wrappers I keep banging on about. So if any of this has confused you, I would prompt you politely to take a look. So there we have it, a reusable and easy way of debouncing any state you like. I would suggest having a go at creating one that throttles input instead of debouncing it, because in the next episode, we're going to be doing just that, but we're going to be doing it in a generic way. So we won't be creating all these different property wrappers. We'll be creating just one process state property wrapper that is going to handle everything. So join me for that. It's going to be brilliant. If you've made it all the way to the end, here's a challenge for you. The projected value here can be simplified, as can the generics of backing state. Answers in the comments, please. And whoever gets it right first gets a mention in the next episode. And what could be more exciting than that? If you like this episode, hit the like button. If you want to subscribe, please do so. In fact, I encourage it wholeheartedly. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions, please leave them below. But in the meantime, thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time.